we're real pleased to see uh, that we have a good turnout. It's very gratifying. I'd like to take just a few moments before tonight's presentation to welcome you to our second night of the 1979 Institute on World Affairs. Again, we'd like to thank GSB for their support of the Institute and again for you for coming out in not the best of weather, but certainly it's been better than what we have had. First, a reminder about tomorrow's activities. There will be a film and discussion at noon here in the gallery. The film will be Taxes, Taxes, followed by a discussion. Uh, and tomorrow night's guest lecturer is Lester Thoreau, and he will address himself to Who Owns America. Uh, I think there were brochures distributed. I think there are still some in the back if you need to have a full schedule of the remainder of the week's events. And there will be an information booth open all week long uh, downstairs from about, usually from 10 to 2. Tonight's topic is the family farm or corporate America who will serve supper. And we have with us General Harold Oppenheimer uh, from Oppenheimer Industries. Their main emphasis is in agriculture and livestock investment, and they have a 69-year history uh, in the business. Also with us is Dr. Harold Braymeyer, uh, who is a professor of economics at the University of Missouri. Professor Braymeyer has been active in several capacities with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'd like to thank both gentlemen for being with us tonight, and our format will be an uh, introductory speech by each of the participants followed by a short rebuttal from each, and then we'll open it to questions from the floor. And if uh, you will address your questions to a, a particular participant, and then the other will have a chance to respond also uh, to your question. And I think uh, in, in fairness, and uh, uh, so things uh, don't tend to drag on, well, we should probably limit the formal uh, questioning to uh, 45 to 50 minutes and, and not much longer. And I'm sure that afterwards, if, if you still have questions, that each will avail himself to you in a, in a more uh, informal situation. So let's turn to the opening remarks. And first off, General Oppenheimer. For the um, last uh, several months, um, I have been delivering uh, talks around the country on the uh, implications of uh, foreign investment uh, in uh, U.S. agricultural land. And I have sort of a set speech, or became sort of a set speech, that I could uh, deliver uh, drunk or sober or standing on my head. Uh, however, uh, last night, uh, my wife, uh, said, uh, Larry, she said, you're not going to be giving uh, your uh, regular speech. Uh, uh, you're supposed to be speaking in Ames, uh, Iowa, on the role of the family farm versus the corporate uh, farm. And I think you're and it's going to be a debate. And I think you're supposed to be supporting the corporate farm. Well, that came as a big surprise and a shock. So uh, in a hurry, beginning about uh, 10 o'clock this morning, I tried to uh, prepare a few remarks on the subject. Uh, not wishing to r uh, ruin the uh, dramatics of, the, of a confrontation with uh, Professor uh, Breimeyer here, I would like to state uh, first off that for the good of the United States, uh, I think the preservation of the family farm is highly desirable, and I hope that our firm, as being a principal source of investment capital for the small family farmer and rancher, uh, has been as influential as anybody else in helping preserve the small farm, the small farmer, and the small rancher. As a sideline, I spent the greater part of my adult life in the United States Marine Corps and historically, almost all of our officers, a majority of our non-coms, and a disproportionately high percentage of our recruits came from the rural areas of the West and the South. There has to be an exception to everything, but I personally have never seen a Marine who came from one of the rural areas of Wyoming, Nebraska, 
Iowa, Missouri, or Kansas, who wasn't an outstanding man and a credit to his country. This is a contribution to the United States that cannot be measured in dollars, but is nonetheless not something that can be ignored. Now, before one can solve a problem, uh, the first step is to know what the problem is. Is the Boswell Corporation the largest, fam the largest farming operation in California with 200 million bucks worth of land, capital, cattle, and equipment, all owned by a single family with no outside stockholders, a family farm? Is Tom Smith's operation out in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, run by himself, his two sons and a daughter, on 1,000 acres leased from a banker in Dusseldorf, Germany, plus 500 acres leased from the widow of a neighbor, plus 640 acres of a school section leased from the government, with half of his cattle being run on contract for a doctor from New York, is this a family farm? Tom uses no outside help on the place other than his children, except he does have his wheat put up in July by a custom harvesting team operating out of Omaha. Tom makes a good living, sends his kids to top colleges, and hopefully we will get one of them to join the Marines. Tom is trying to expand by getting more land to lease and more cattle to run on contract. He keeps his relatively limited amount of capital intact as best he can for investment in equipment and operating capital, and he's doing everything he possibly can to avoid paying a banker or an insurance company 11% interest on a mortgage. His ambition in life is to get big enough to compete with Boswell. Seriously, while this is a hypothetical situation, we have been involved with at least 400 such ranchers or farmers over the years who fit Tom Smith's picture. What is a small farmer or rancher faced with today? He's got two problems. One, he has to expand to a size that is economically competitive in the industry as it exists in January 1979, and we're not talking about 1890, and we're not talking about 1950. Two, he needs to obtain the capital for this expansion at a rate that is not going to be prohibitively expensive. We've done a lot of theorizing so far. Now let's get down to the actual numbers. In my opinion, Nobody engaged in grain production in the United States can give his family a decent living or can afford modern farming equipment on less than 300 acres. At 2,000 bucks per acre, this is $600,000. A complete line of farming equipment and associated buildings will cost $100,000 and you need $100,000 of operating capital, and altogether this comes to an investment of $800,000. The banks and insurance, com insurance companies are not going to loan you more than $500,000, and they are going to require 10% interest and 5% amortization for a total debt service of $75,000 per year. This is what it's going to take to support their loans. You need, that's for 500,000. You need another 300,000 in equity capital unless you had a wealthy father or married a rich wife. Two acceptable alternatives. <laughs> what about ranching? Until this recent jump in prices, which opened up a new ballpark, you had to have a minimum 
of a 500 cow herd to be competitive. In Nebraska, this takes a 5,000 acre ranch. The total investment in land, cattle, equipment, and operating capital comes to about 1.5 million. This time, if you're starting out, you need an even wealthier wife. How can you avoid the friendly clutches of the local banker who wants 10% interest and a 25% compensating balance, which you may or may not have? Incidentally, a 25% compensating balance is like paying 13% interest. Unfortunately, today, that is only 1.5% more than General Motors is paying. How do you get capital without borrowing? Several alternatives outside of robbing a bank. One, first you can form a corporation or a partnership and take in outside par stockholders or partners. This is the way General Motors does it. It's hard to do in farming. Second, you can lease land on a cash lease at 3 to 4% of its market value. This is the way Safeway Stores has been doing it for 40 years. It's better than paying the equivalent of 13% to your banker. If you want to pay more and get the guy in Dusseldorf to take part of the risk, you might get into a share crop lease with him. This is a second me means of getting outside capital, leasing land instead of buying it. Third, if you're in the cattle business or the feeder business, you can partially stock your ranch or feedlot with tenant cattle. Let the New York banker pay 13% to, let the New York doctor pay 13% to his banker. Don't you do it. In addition, while it's pleasant owning all the cattle on the ranch when the market goes up, it is also nice to have someone else share the risk when it goes down. For a hundred years, small farmer, family farmers and ranchers have acquired the use of capital from these sources in order to compete with the large farmer and the corporate farmer. This is not something new. If the issue, as between the Boswell family and Tom Smith, is not one of land, tenure, and ownership, but of size, are we really saying that we want to limit the size of farms or ranchers, whether they are owned by one family or a public corporation? This is a different issue. If so, what size is it desirable to set the limit on? Do we want to bring in the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is on the books? At what level? 2,000 acres? 2,000 cows, 160 acres of irrigated land that uses public water. It's the problem in the San Joaquin in California. These are different questions which I am not adequately uh, prepared to discuss. I'd be glad to talk about them, but I do not have an adequate background for discussion of those questions. What size do we want to put a limit on a farm or a ranch? Uh, this is not a question of who owns it. Okay, thank you. Now we'll turn to Professor Braymeyer. General Oppenheimer, considerately did not take too much of your time. I talk faster than he does, and I think I can be equally brief so we can have some discussion. I'll hit some points rather quickly. Uh, not that it really matters. General Oppenheimer did pronounce my name with the long I, which I do. I'm Brian Meyer, and I'm an agricultural economist, not a general economist. I'm in both teaching and extension at Missouri. These are fascinating four days in your program. Gee, it's wonderful. General, you must be a real attraction. I can't get an overflow crowd, so it must be to your credit that you, they actually had to get chairs out here. 
It's much to, your, to the credit of all of you for coming, and I hope you'll come these four days. It should be a fascinating experience for you. Not to be slightly negative, I'm not, but I'm not real sure just what you will learn. Learning is a painful process, and most of us cherish the ideas we have and carry around with, with us, and we don't relinquish them very easily. And I'm not sure whether you're going to go out of here tonight with any different set of ideas and observations you had when you, or, or Thursday than you have now or not. Uh, I, I even work hard with my students, getting them to change some of the ways they, they look at things. But what will you, will you learn these five days is quite a bit about the identity of the people whom you listen to. And you're going to find that each one of us in economic language is a differentiated product. Each of us has different things we're going to present, different personalities. Uh, this is true of economists, it's true of political scientists, it's true of managers, it's true of, of sociologists. And I'm not sure whether this is good. I'm afraid that what we're doing, I think maybe increasingly, is drifting into categorical positions. You know, everybody has his own school of thought and this is it, and never the two or three shall meet. In economics, for example, there's a Friedman monetarist, and boy, they think this, what's that called sectarianism? Friedman monetarist, the Chicago school, which is closely related. The Keynesians now are sort of in hiding. So now what we... <laughs> So we have the post-Keynesians. <laughs> the institutionalists have, have revived. And now the Marxists. We've got such a, such a situation now where it's now respectable again for the Marxist group, group to say, well, Marx did have some ideas after all, and you're going to hear from one, I think. I think it's rather too bad that we can scarcely cross, you know, communicate among ourselves, each holding to his own true gospel. But that's one of the things you're going to find these days, that each person is going to see the world differently. Well, what am I? Well, I guess maybe if you help you a little bit, I think maybe I'm an agrarian traditionalist. Well, you can decide that for yourself. Now, General Oppenheimer said uh, something about uh, uh, confrontation and so on. I'm not much for confrontation, dramatics of confrontation, whether we get this. I'm not too much for a debate. I don't really have that kind of an instinct. Uh, but I'm going to go to my subject real quickly, then we'll see what happens. What's involved in the subject of what kind of agriculture we're going to have? What's happening? And then, does it matter? Rather quickly. And I'm speaking pretty much following, oh, about seven or eight years, the extension of agricultural economists of the Midwestern states, including those at Iowa, Iowa State here, have joined for about five or six years dealing with what I think is the number one policy issue in agriculture, namely what kind of agriculture we're going to have. We call it who's going to own and control. And then this fall, we had in our campus a seminar, Can the Family Farm Survive? Question. And pretty much what I'm going to say is what came out of the seminar, where we had some very interesting speakers. I'm going to do, go down through it rather quickly. The agricultural tradition is deep in the American heritage. I think it's a genuine tradition. In our country, early days of the country, we start off in several directions from the New England kind of small farms. Then, of course, you know the original Virginia farms, many of them are plantations. In the southwest, we went, got the hacienda. But after a period of time, we seem to settle on the idea that we did want to have the individual proprietorship that's come to be known rather loosely as the family farm. And of course, Thomas Jefferson is the major spokesman for this. I want to speak very respectfully of this. I am something of a traditionalist. Very respectfully of this, because these people uh, facing a new continent were, were, were fresh from the European experience, the, 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 the feudal experience. And in a sense, what they said was that we want to be sure that in these uni new United States of America, a democratic republic, the man or woman who works on the soil shall be able to hold his head high. It had to do with the status, not the economics the status of the person who, who tills the soil and tends the herds. Because in feudal Europe, they were the lowest in the totem pole, and our forefathers said, we aren't going to have it that way in this country. And of course, as everyone knows, the primary, the most explicit of all the actions on this was the Homestead Act with 160 acres, and if you farm it, and so on and so forth. Now, this is well known, so it won't take much time. Uh, to save time, I'm going to go th very quickly through this. What do we mean by it? Now, my meaning, my definition, or the definition we used in our seminar will differ a little bit from General Oppenheimer's more specifically. We define it, and, I, and you have to be rather, let me be careful. 
I don't want to play numbers game about exactly where the cutoff point is, but I say you have to be faithful to a concept or the whole thing just disappears. The family farm is one in which the operator plays three roles. He is the worker, he is the manager, and he is at least an owner of part of the land. Now this is where General Oppenheimer used a little bit different because he talked about having outside capital for the ownership of the land. I do not say that a family farmer cannot be a tenant for his first few years. I do not say that he has to own all the land, but our group, the Midwest economists, were rather firm in saying unless he owns part of the land, he is breaking with the heritage of what we have meant in this country in terms of a family farmer. And in, 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 in providing the labor, we say, therefore, the family must provide half or more of the labor. And since this is true, you have to put some kind of a limit, and the limit would be in terms of man years of labor. And I agree with the general, you don't put it in terms of, of acreage or number of livestock. And we say at the outside, two man years of family labor and two man years of hired labor, although a number of our people said one and a half should be the limit. One and a half man years of family labor and one and a half man years of hired labor is the maximum size of the family farm. But you have to stay with something like this. Uh, you know, you talk about the big one in California. I have another, California is always the example, and I use this many times. I was in a meeting not so long ago, and this is a lady. And I hate to say it, but she was pretty brassy. She told me, she told me what the issues were in agriculture. I was, I was a speaker, but she was telling me, but that's all right. But what she says is, I'm a family farmer. And if I remember, she had 30,000 irrigated acres in the Imperial Valley, she and her husband. She says she's a family farmer. I'm sure they hired Mexican-Americans by the hundreds. And I'm sure also they use the whole thing operates on free water coming from the federal government. But she called her, I've never found anybody who didn't call himself a family farmer. But if you do that, then the whole thing, the problem vanishes. And, and we, in extension, have st said you have to stay with us pretty, pretty sharply. What is happening? No question about it. We're moving to a dual agriculture. We're moving to an agriculture. On one side, you have many very small farms, a few very large farms. The gap in between is where the family farmer used to be, and he is gradually fading out. We have a great many small farms. We don't have so many of the larger farms, but one of the statistics of it is now, 1977, 50 per, the 50% smallest farms market the 3% of all the products. The largest one-fourth market 85, but what's more significant is that number keeps going up. Relatively, we're concentrating more and more. We often, we often have the image of, of agriculture being mostly the typical family farmer on, uh, on 120 or 240 or 300 acres. That's all right. Whatever it figure, depending where you are, it varies. East be fewer, west more. At any rate, on, on an ordinary farm, full-time, income only from farming, and to be ungrammatical about it, you can't hardly get that kind no more. The great numbers are the, are the little tracks outside from cities. The great volume is on farms that are of some size and larger than family farm is one of the categories. Estimates are pretty clear. At least 10% of all marketings come from truly industrial type corporation farms. The big feedlots, the first, the first colony farms in North Carolina, Tenneco and so on, make up 10%. Contractual integration is 15%. I think the, typical fam the true family farm is now less than half. I do not agree that a majority comes from the family farm. And at least 20%, probably 25, comes from the larger than family farm, which is not the big corporate, but just simply the multiple unit farm. The Mr. Benedict of Time magazine is a good example if you read that story shortly before Christmas. That's the growing part. Uh, why are these changes taking place? We're moving to a, a large corporate agriculture, slowly, not fast, but slowly. This is the whole economy is going that way. Why are taking place? We said there are several reasons. We do not think it's technology. We think that technology is adequate for the average family farmer as well as for the large. We do not think that there's any necessary difference or appreciable difference. We think it's financing. And without taking time to go into all of it, that the, even the financial costs in operation, and here's I'm with General Oppenheimer, the issue is where they get the capital. The issue is where's the capital coming from and what are the terms? He says, let it come from off the farm. I'm saying if you do that, you don't have the family farm in the traditional sense. You can still have the operator fully in charge of his operation, but he doesn't own the land. He leases it. And this is, this is one of the possibilities. And you'll live very well. I'm saying in a moment, you're not going to affect productivity very much. You can work real well. You're, it's a question of what kind of a country you want. What's your image? What's your goal? 
Uh, but the second and biggest reason are tax rules. And I, I know General Oppenheimer knows how to come to that. I've argued with Ron Jarvis about this and so on. He is a very good manager of the lands, and I've read his cowboy arithmetic, and much of the cattle money came from <coughs> tax shelter. One of the, the only sharp language I'm going to use, because I get really provoked about it, Every time I go out and somebody talks about a free enterprise economy, I said, don't say that. Ours is not a free enterprise economy. It's an enterprise economy, but not free. You cannot have a free enterprise economy with a high tax economy. Because whenever you have a high tax economy, the terms of levying taxes becomes a major consideration in the organization and, and, and management of, of economic affairs. And what you've had is an enormous, an enormous kind of income tax subsidy by income tax write-off. The significant thing about this, if you haven't studied this in economics and so on, the, the, the significant thing that whereas a direct subsidy as through your deficiency payments is proportional to the size of the operation, the dedu tax deduction is proportional to the tax bracket of the investor, which means if you're in the 40% bracket, you get twice the value. If you're in the 20%, from the 60% bracket, you get three times the benefit of being in the 20% bracket. So probably the, the, the present inflation in land values spurred in part by tax rules is creating a land boom that is simply putting land out of the reach of the ordinary farmer. It simply is out of the reach of the ordinary farmer. And if this continues so that you cannot bring in new farmers generating their capital through their own operation, then of course, General Oppenheimer is absolutely right, then you have to go either two of routes. Either you have to have a federal program that makes capital available to young farmers, and by the way, the New Farmers Home Administration has a very small, tiny program on a very selective basis, will finance a few young farmers on a very, really very generous basis. Either that or you have the question of what are the terms of getting finance capital from urban sources. And this is really pretty much what the issue is about. Uh, what does it matter? I've already said a moment about that, and I'm going to say I'm going to be quite, try to be just as brief as he was, considerate in that respect. All our economists have said in terms of having enough food for all the people in the United States, we think it doesn't matter. Our resources are so great and we're still sh far short of using all our, our productive resources that we're going to have enough food and fiber for our people and for export, irrespective, because the big operations well managed, they're productive too. It's back to your, really, your socio-political goals, concept of status, concept of what what do you want the man on the land to be? Also the community. Of all our committee among the various states, we probably had more unanimity on this. Whenever you change from a family farm agriculture to an outside ownership agriculture, however managed, you change the fabric of the local community because our, most of our rural communities have been built upon the family, and particularly in Iowa and the Midwest, have been built upon the in individual family farm and the service industries that go with it. And if you go to a large agribusiness agriculture, those service industries, not only will the status of the farmer be changed, some of the income, of course, we've taken off because instead of having the incomes from all three roles, the farmer will have incomes from only one or two roles, and the other income will go off away from the locality. And then in a really large agribusiness agriculture or corporate agriculture, while your service industries will be located near the, in the big cities, they would not be scattered among the county seat towns as you have now. Now here again, I'm not arguing for or against. I'm willing to, but that really don't, I don't think that's my role here. What I'm saying is that the consensus of the people whom I've worked with who've worked at this say these are the considerations. Now there's only one other, and even though, and I don't want to make this a scare tactic, but almost all urban groups I've talked with have said, what would happen if you converted all agriculture just to relatively few corporations? Then I said you'd have, then of course you'd have an oligopoly agriculture, and we aren't even close to that. But of course, if you went all the way, if you want to be a little bit scary, but went all the way, then of course you would have a kind of oligopoly power in the, in the supplying of food that you aren't even close to having now. Then of course you would have some chance for, for the rise, for the increased prices of food, protecting incomes to agriculture quite well. And almost all surveys, all, to my knowledge, all surveys made of urban people will show the urban people to be just as much in favor of our traditional agriculture as farmers are for somewhat different reason. One reason is they like the image of the independent, sturdy farmer. Kind of nostalgic, but it still it's genuine. But the second is a little bit afraid of, of what might happen to the price of food if agriculture and the food system got into a relatively few hands. Now let me correct any misimpression I may have given. 
I don't think anything General Oppenheimer said had to do with concentrating in a few hands. But I'm saying that is one possible picture that, that some people have in mind. And so that is one slight negative. But the, the main point that we've talked about is really, what about the American dream? What about, does it matter what the role may be of the person who provides your food and fiber? Thank you very much. General Oppenheimer, would you like to respond? Uh, we're, we're, nearly, we're not really, uh, it's a matter of uh, philosophy uh, in our difference of opinions here. Uh, I'll repeat back, if you, and I think this probably would apply to maybe half the people in the room here, if uh, you have not uh, got a family farm at the present time or one that is adequate, uh, and, and you are, you have brothers and sisters who will inherit part of it. So you are going to have, to, you want to become a family farmer. Uh, you aren't, uh, you haven't got one yet in your, in your 20s. Uh, you are going to have, to, if you want a decent operation that uh, is economically feasible, you're going to have to somehow get about $800,000 together. Um, in other words, it's fine to preserve a family farm, but what about a lot of young guys with, as I say, with brothers and sisters who want to become a family farmer and are not going to inherit a family farming combination. They are not going to inherit the $800,000 necessary. So they want to become, they want to enter the business and become a family farm, okay? 800,000 bucks price tag. How do you get the money? Right now, as I mentioned, you can find people who will buy the land, buy the land next door to your farm so you can expand <clears throat> and rent it to you at 3% net. You might have to pay four, but you can probably get it at three to 4% net rent. Why are they willing to make an investment and only get a three to four you might have inherited so that you can start competing on this market. So there is some advantage to you to be able to have access to this outside capital at cheaper than the 11 to 13 percent that you will have to pay the normal commercial sources if you borrow it. Now, if a family farm, which I consider highly desirable, is going to now, we're now getting into a different field as I ended my little discussion. We're not talking about who owns the family farm. Boswell, the Boswell family own their family farms. Uh, the professor, Brymar's friends in the Imperial Valley presumably owned their 30,000 acres. Uh, they are not a family farm because they are now so big that they are employing great quantities of outside people and great quantities of uh, machinery and great quantities of this, that, and the other thing. So the size has now entered into the subject. And the question is, <clears throat> where should we take political action if necessary? And there are all kinds of things that can be done to restrict the size of farms or ranches getting any bigger. At what point do we want <clears throat> to stop them, to hinder them, and keep them from getting any larger, if that is what we're discussing, because after they get to a certain size, they are no longer a family farm and therefore no longer desirable, regardless of whether one family owns them or whether several families own them or whether a corporation owns them. We're now talking about a different issue. How restrictive should we be as a matter of philosophy, not economics, philosophy, and there's nothing wrong with philosophy, as a matter of philosophy, how restrictive should we be for the good of the United States in limiting the amount of land or labor, agricultural labor, that can be employed on one operation, whether it's owned by one man or a corporation? That is a different issue and one that we will address ourselves to right now. If a family farm is defined as one in which half of the existing labor 
is furnished by the family, and only one additional hired hand or a hired hand and his family is employed, and that's the definition. Uh, that's uh, a position to take. Uh, that would mean uh, normally today 400 acres pre presumably under cultivation, a cattle herd of four or 500 head. One thing about a cow is that she never knows whether it's Saturday or Sunday. So consequently, if you want to get Saturday and Sunday off once in a while and you don't have children that can hold a fort, uh, even a three or 400 head herd is going to take two people. So if you get up to six or 700 head, uh, you have now gotten beyond the limits of a family farm as so defined. Now, I'm not arguing this point. I just am asking everybody to recognize it. And maybe there's an element of a value to it. Is it desirable in the United States that nobody be permitted under single control to far farm over 500 acres? or to have a cattle herd over 700 head. There are various ways of ensuring that that will take place. One uh, would be to put restrictive taxes on anybody that exceeds that amount. Another, uh, as is happening in the uh, California right now, that uh, they're enforcing a 70-year-old law that anybody receiving uh, using public water, water from a public project that was built by U.S. citizens income taxes, taxes uh, was restricted to not having more than 160 acres under irrigation. Uh, that's got California in a state of considerable uproar uh, and also a few other states. Uh, this, if this is a public policy, if this is desirable, uh, there's nothing wrong in it. This is why we elect congressmen and why we uh, hire people to advise us, and maybe it's a good policy. I personally do not think it is, but if this is what needs to be done, fine. So if we have make the decision that we find it philosophically, not economically, philosophically desirable to not have any agricultural enterprise cultivating more than 500 acres of land, or 700 cows, this is a subject that could be reviewed. Thank you. Dr. Bramer, would you like to respond? Or? As, I remember from high, is this on? As I remember from high school, only the affirmative gets a rebuttal. The negative does not. Isn't that right in debate? <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll get my points in during this. Let's open it now to questions, and uh, those in the back, if, if you have questions, please stand up so we can hear up here. We had problems last night with people uh, from the back who couldn't hear. Yes? Uh, Mr. Breimer is correct in saying that technology is a little bit indifferent with respect to farms and different sizes. It seems to me one of the variables that you haven't talked about is how many people one farm on this minimum size farm. I wondered in terms of those farmers' home administration loans that you said are generous but few, how many applicants that are qualified are likely to apply to such a loan if they think they've got a chance? This question of whether young people still want to farm came up at our seminar. We have no survey. But if my experience in our extension meetings, I'll get up here where you seen. If my experience in our extension meetings, is this all being recorded or not? All right, the question was, in case this is being recorded, we should always repeat the question, General. The question was, are, do people really want to, you know, play the old game when it's a tough game of trying to accumulate some of the capital through in your own operation and so on? And by the way, General, uh, I do not require the 800000 because uh, I'm saying that the part ownership is still not a bad deal, and, and if you had enough to get the leg, that would be substantial gain, I would say, these young people. This question came up at our seminars, whether young people still want to, to be young family farms, and all I could say was that based upon, I teach classes in farm policy out in the state, kind of interesting thing, one night a week, the snowy weather is kind of rough, but if I read them right, they still do. I can't be sure, 
But my guess is that the farmer's home will get many more applicants than they have money for. In fact, they've often said that one of the most difficult features of a governmental program to do this is the screening. But the answer came back is, well, who's been doing the screening? And the answer is all your rural bankers. Would you like to say anything on the, on the subject, on the question? Any other questions, please? Yes? Uh, this is for either one. If you had like a two or three generation family, like five or six kids per generation to multiply, and they did all the work on the family farm and it kept increasing like say a, a thousand acres per single family unit, what would that be considered after it acquired maybe a hundred thousand acres after the third generation with ten separate families, but yet still a family corporation, what would that be considered with, when they own all the land within the corporation, do all the work and own everything? Would that be considered a corporate farm or a family farm when they're all still related to be cousins or second cousins? All right, let me respond first. I'm sure the general will respond too. I was very careful not to say 500 acres or so. When I was talking only in terms of, of the labor force, I would say if they really did that, that would still be a family farm. I would say very fast, it has been very rare, very seldom does a family stay that closely knit that they really cooperatively stay and, and farm together. Sometimes you get two, maybe occasionally three, but almost always one or two of them decide that isn't really what they want to do or they get to fighting. And, and one of the bigger problems is, one of the bigger problems where there are several children is if they get one that wants to farm, the biggest problem he has is, is what his brothers and sisters are going to, what blood they want before he can have access to the farm. So I think definitionally that would still be a family farm. I think practically it will happen very rarely. What do you say? Uh, this, this is a, 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 an area, we're principally in the ranching and cattle business more than in the farming end of it. But uh, I have personally uh, had an uh, opportunity to observe a number of the major ranching families in the United States who have built uh, big empires. And the history of the family is almost like a chore choreography of a ballet. You can almost predict every step for each generation because it's happened numerous times and, and offhand I can hardly think of an exception to what I'm about to tell you. Uh, the first, the great grandfather grabbed the land from the Indians about 110, 20 years ago. Then his, the, the grandfather doubled it, added to it. The son, the next generation, uh, there are now about five families that own it, and they're all splitting up. Uh, one, one of the family maybe wants to stay in the place, and he runs it, and he sort of holds it together. That's the father. One, one of the fathers. Then he dies. Now there are none of the family left, and there's something about uh, being in the cattle business, particularly of the old school, that makes you particularly feisty. So now there are 30 heirs or 40 heirs, and they're all fighting each other, and they're all in the courts, and no one is talking to each other. Most of the ch uh, cousins don't even know each other. Uh, half of them live on the Riviera in, Par in France. Uh, some, the, the ones that ride horses are only doing it to play polo. Uh, the, uh, uh, it is a great big battle, and every major ranching family operation that I know of has followed that pattern. I would not call it a particularly a family ranch anymore. Yes. Is there not a practical problem in where money is coming from? If we take our small banks in Iowa, and I judge in Missouri too, there is a limitation, a very serious limitation on capital available. They want a quick turnaround. It seems to me that country <coughs> bankers are not very well acquainted with intermediate and long-term loans, and they should be. So where does the money come from that is needed in our family businesses? I'll, I'll follow you. you go ahead. Uh, that's, uh, you, you've uh, hit the, nut, uh, the uh, uh, nail on the head. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> right. Uh, that's just the question. Now, where is it going to come from? And
And uh, if uh, you have a good long-term relationship with your country banker, uh, he will continue to support you. Uh, the country bankers aren't the country bankers they used to be, and they now have lots of competitive loans, and they frequently have stockholders to answer to themselves who are watching the annual earnings statement. So uh, if they're, they're not about to make a loan to their old buddy or the, her, their old buddy's grandson at 2 or 3% less than the uh, prime rate, which they one time did, uh, now they want to get the same rate they can get by loaning to General Motors or making loans on commercial paper or a number of other things they can do so that uh, the grandson of their old buddy is finding it increasingly difficult to get a loan out of his grandfather's bank. Uh, one way they get around it, to many, uh, as I did cover previously, is the old name of compensating balance. Uh, if you keep uh, $100,000 in the bank, in, that we're at, uh, in a checking account, and let the bank draw interest on it, uh, then he will be quite inclined to uh, loan you another $200,000 uh, at a very at a less than normal rate of interest because effectively he's getting a very high rate from you. Uh, as far as long-term loans are concerned with banks, uh, in the old days they would make 10 or 15 year loans. Uh, today it is extremely rare that you'll find any bank making more than a five-year loan. Uh, most banks will not make more than a one-year loan. They want their capital back again, and they want to be able to call the loan in the event they think things are going sour. So the banks are not a very good source of long-term capital. Uh, the insurance companies, on the other hand, are making long-term loans, but they are under pressure from their stockholders and the days when they would make loans to young farmers and ranchers as a public service uh, are gone from ever, or forever. They don't even want to make small loans anymore. They want to make big ones because their cost of servicing a big loan is not any greater than the cost of servicing five little ones. So the normal sources of borrowed capital are getting tougher and tougher, particularly for a young guy starting out. Just a couple of comments. Uh, I agree with the general that the, the, the way, the terms of many loans leave much to be desired. Our farm management specialists in Missouri tell me that they really can't say there hasn't been enough capital, that, that the banks, local banks do rediscount and so on. They have various relationships with city banks and that, that our young farmers, the capital still is there. Or to put it differently, it would be very hard for an agriculture worried about overproduction to say that's undercapitalized. But what it is, as the general just said, it's very selective as to whom can get, who can get it. And it's the young farmer trying to get started is the one who has the most trouble. But one point that hasn't been made. The reason the land is priced so high out of their reach so much so that those who do hold it make it available at 3% is that land has an additional value to those who can use it for their tax advantage in that they, that the tax, that they in effect bid their tax advantage into the price of the land and therefore, the price to those who do not have a tax advantage is, is beyond what they can, they can earn from it, whereas it's, it's a perfectly good investment to those who, who have some tax advantage in their ownership. And you put that along with continued inflation, the low capital gains tax, and you have the kind of a struck. What I'm trying to lead to is if you had a different economy in agriculture, the price of land wouldn't be so high, then it would be easier for the younger farmers to buy it. state tax really made a tilt towards the so-called family farm by saying that if you have this size of state, we'll keep it together for 15 years after the debt. You can postpone the taxes and pay 4% interest on the money. It seems to me that that's a policy decision that Congress has made to encourage the family farm as opposed to the corporate farm. Uh, yeah. You're uh, absolutely right on that point. The most uh, significant action uh, taken by the Congress, to my knowledge, in the last decade has been that portion of the bill. Uh, so uh, that a person that wants to preserve a, fa a farm in operation uh, through the family uh, has a, a distinct break on inheritance taxes where before a great number of the farms and the ranches were broken up 
uh, because there was no way they had the funds, the ready cash to pay the taxes. I see Neil Harrell back here. I won't call on you because, but I'm going to read. I'm going to, I'm going to read your document on this real soon. I just keep putting it off and putting it off. That, I would say yes and no. I won't say yes. I'll, I will say yes and no. When the action began to change the inheritance tax law to make concession for the family farm, it was to, to really give a break for the smaller family farm. As happened so often, it began this way, ended up as where the, the concession gets to be a little bit larger than I would really call a family farm. And it is really quite a concession. It has some, some aspects of it that I don't like very much. It can, it, boy, the legalisms. Neil, you know this. They call this the Tax Accountants and Lawyers Relief Act. <laughs> They're going to make an, a fortune in ministering it. But it's going to be real hard to separate out the one who really is an operating farmer from the one who is nominally a farmer from tax purposes. It's going to be real, real rough. And it, it's so attractive, I'm a little bit afraid it's going to be attractive to, to some of those who are somewhat larger than I would call it a genuine family farm. But this much, uh, I also want to say, if you really... Also, when it gets to, if you're going to use the inheritance tax to preserve family farming, it's got to be tough enough that when you get beyond the family farm size, that it's got to force some breakup. That's the only way you keep from having is a continuing build up of size of estate land up with landed gentry. But the only way, as farms get bigger and bigger, to have then some parcels that young farmers can, can uh, buy is to force, let's say, the 3,000 acre to sell off a couple 400 acre tracks, just to take numbers out. And this is where you get the sharpest division in agriculture. Because those who have the big farms don't want their estates to have, and they, they, they don't want their kids to have to reaccumulate capital, I understand why. On the other hand, if you let the state get bigger and bigger, then you have no opportunity for the young farmer to come in. And this is the most divisive thing in agriculture right now. Uh, it's a very, if, if, if we hit a, which I don't believe in, but if we hit this philosophical point of saying we want to break up the larger farms into, and splinter them into smaller ones. Uh, it is a, which uh, I don't, I'm not certain that uh, uh, Dr. Brymar really means that. Uh, that uh, I do. You do. <laughs> okay. But not I, a small one, smaller. Okay, now, I, it's, it's, a, it's a very, if, if this is a, as a program, which of course we have never yet had in this country, it's a very simple matter to do it. Uh, we can, uh, he, if you're one's opposed to the exemption that the federal government did give to preserve uh, uh, the passing on of farms to the next generation without this uh, very severe tax, we could reverse that and uh, very quickly pass a bill of Congress wants to do it, saying that any farm that involves over $500,000 of land will get a special punitive inheritance tax, like an extra 40%, 50%, 70%. They have that in England, by the way, 90%. If that is the way we want to go in this country, fine. So somebody dies, and he will be forced to sell his farm and break it up in parcels or sell it to somebody else because he won't have the money, nor will his heirs have the money to pay a 80 or 90 percent inheritance tax. So that will bring a lot of land on the market very cheap. One correction. We have indeed had such a law near when it began, 1914. We have had a graduated estate tax for around 60 years. How far off am I? All right, it doesn't matter the years. No, General, we have had this policy. We have had a graduated estate tax. And by the way, for the larger increments, it's fairly steep. You know the numbers. So this is not new. We've had it. The question is, what shall be the, the only question is, what shall be the numbers that go into that curve? It's low. You know, you have certain exemption. Then the next increment is very low. The next increment a little higher. It's simply a graduated estate tax. We've had one for 60 years. I have a, um, I, I fortunately, I'm not inheriting anything from it, but uh, I have a very, very wealthy stepfather. And
and uh, uh, I was, I, I was, uh, uh, we, we hardly talked to each other. Uh, now, I have a half-sister who was a very strong supporter of Senator McGovern when he was running for uh, president. And uh, Senator McGovern uh, had a, was, had a bill that there would be no, uh, there would be a 100 percent uh, inheritance tax, 100 percent on all estates over $500,000. That was part of his program. So that nobody in the United States would in ever inherit more than $500,000 again. So my uh, sister uh, was, as I say, was supporting this. My stepfather called her and said, uh, Gene, I said, you don't have to worry about inher anybody inheriting more than $500,000 because I'm disinheriting you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was, he was first. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Dreimer, I guess I'll review a couple of things from your opening statement. Question. On one hand, you say that the type of agriculture that we could go to is largely a matter of social political goals. Secondly, you said we're moving slowly for what you call corporate agriculture. While at the same time, the general feeling seems to be among both rural and urban people for what you term a traditional agriculture. This seems to imply that there are some weaknesses in how we assess our values be what our social political goals are. So, and what are some of the things? I keep forgetting to repeat the question just for the record, and I'm not really sure I have. You gave me three or four questions. Uh, let me sure I have it right. Do we know for sure where we want to go? I think, I think we, are, we are not at all sure where we want to go. But in addition, and this leads to another point, and a few people like Herb Howell probably get my extension letter. I've made this kind of preaching so often. U.S. agriculture does not really understand the kind of issues we are raising here tonight. The surveys, if you ask farmers what they really want for the future, they all generally, they all vote for family farm. But you start asking what particular policies might lead to it, what you get is the dilemma between what I call farmers' non-instinct for self-preservation. They do not understand the relationship between individual policies that look good to them on their own farm, particular policies that look good to their own farm, yet may harm family farming collectively. And the tax write-offs is one of them. Uh, the tax write-offs look good to the individual farmer, and the individual farmer, although my students know it because I sure drum it into them, if an individual farmer doesn't know that a small write-off for him becomes magnified to a big bit write-off to his non-farm competitor. And the, and the under, you see, so this is a whole new area. Herb Powell, we taught price supports and everything for 30 years. We haven't talked this until the 1970s. The 1970s is the first time we've talked this subject. And of course, the reason it came in the 1970s, you had such an escalation in land values that suddenly the question of how to get capital became a real genuine question. But the, one of the weaknesses, one of the strengths of family farm agriculture is also its weakness in policy making. The very independence of the individual unit is so stalwart that we respect it very much, at least I do. Makes the farmer so concerned for his own operation that he is not, doesn't have a real sharp consciousness of what kind of policies affect agriculture or farming as a whole. It's, it's, the, it's the micro versus macro, it's the individual versus the unit. And there's a large, a long educational process going on. It's, it's going to be, as I say, it's going to be real hard. But I think it's not a lack of sympathy with some of these things. I think it's just lack of understanding of what some of these policy issues is, policy issues are, which I assume is why this is on the subject, on on your program, and why you're here. Do you want to respond? Just a a minor point. After the 1976 tax bill and the 1978 tax bill, uh, there are practically, as far as land ownership is concerned, uh, no tax benefits of any magnitude that I know about. Uh, you cannot deduct prepaid feed. You cannot deduct prepaid interest. 
uh, you are, the government is extremely tough on any depreciation. There are, the tax benefits that previously existed have now become almost non-existent. Yes, go ahead. Strong, non-existent, but let it pass. Uh, okay. It seems to me that we have a myth, or is it a myth, that the family farm uh, has higher production, is more concerned about the conservation of the land, as well as pulls that local community together. Now, can you compare the two family farm and the corporate farm in terms of all three of those things. All right. I think one has to, uh, the question was, what about some of these so-called virtues of the family farm, the holding the community together, conservation, and so on? I think family farmers should be just a little bit careful on claiming too much virtue for themselves. Uh, I sometimes tell my audiences, don't break your aren't patting yourself on the back. Uh, and I think to some extent the differences between farmers and non-farmers are, are, are narrowing. I don't think there's that much difference. I personally think that the family farm has done reasonably well in conserving the soil. I think they do have this traditional respect for the soil and what they're doing. On the other hand, I know some who are not doing the job either. Uh, in some respects, a large corporate agriculture, if it were geared the right way, would be, might be more effective in so good soil conservation practices because if the manager said, you're all going to tear us, they'd all tear us. Whereas now, if you go out in the county and say, you all ought to tear us, half of them will tear us and half of them wouldn't. So although I, here's what, and now and then you get in this say, don't tell me the family farmers are, you know, they're all the virtuous and so on. You know, so I didn't use that argument, neither did you. I respect them, but I don't think that is really the, the question. On the other hand, on the sociological question as to whether a, an, a proprietary fa agriculture, areas of proprietary agriculture are better by the tests of participation in local government and so on and so forth as against wage labor agriculture or even for that matter contractee agriculture as in broilers. The all, almost all the surveys give the same results. That there is a difference and this is genuine, not just pretended. What we're talking about, among other things, you see, is whether you want to have, go to, back to a caste system. And Iowa is rather free of a caste system because of family farm agriculture. When you go to three levels, straight, when you stratify your community, you do change the sociology of it. I, I, I'm quite sure of that. Uh, just, uh, w one point that's uh, somewhat <coughs> dragged in from the side. Uh, we, we have... Um, uh, represented a, a fair number of uh, foreign buyers of agricultural land, particularly from uh, West Germany. Uh, the total, of, uh, this is a subject I've had to go into in quite detail, the total amount of foreign ownership of U.S. agricultural land or ranching land all over the country, as far as the USDA has been able to determine at this point, is somewhere between half of 1 percent and 3 tenths of 1 percent, so it's nothing very dramatic. However, uh, the people that we've been associated with, particularly the Germans, uh, when they have acquired the properties, they have employed, uh, they put a lot of capital into improving the soil and improving the place, uh, much more so than any of our U.S. Uh, clients uh, would normally do, and much more so than people in the neighborhood have traditionally done. So it, for this particular group of American landowners, the West Germans, uh, they are certainly a major asset to their community, to the local communities in which they own properties, and they have, uh, in many cases, participated in local affairs and, uh, in every way that I know of, have been excellent neighbors. Yes. General, you said before uh, that you would want to have a punitive tax on estates over $500,000. Say, like if a farmer had two or three sons, and you said he had to have 300 to 400 acres to make a living at it, that would be anywhere from 600 to 1,200 acres, which would make his estate over 500,000 to a million and a half. And uh, since he would have a punitive tax over 500,000, it'd break up the farm that he'd want his son to have, but then really would it break it up because if he was a smart farmer, he'd have $2 million worth of life insurance on his 
himself anyway take care of estate taxes when he died. So really would that punitive tax be really worth the effort to put into the law when it, when it might not affect? Uh, the um, question was, <clears throat> if there was a punitive tax that was 100% confiscatory for an estate over half a million dollars, uh, by the way, I'm, I, am, I personally am very much opposed to anything like that. Well, right, oh, right. But I'm just saying this, a, a, a punitive tax would, of that nature, would be very effective in breaking up large holdings.